Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Colonel Charles Galbraith. He's the Deputy Chief Technology Officer and Innovation Officer for the Space Force. Colonel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you today about uh, some of the great work that our Guardians are doing across the Space Force. So one of the interesting things about the Space Force is when it was pitched to the world, when it was brought out and uh, kind of gave everyone its first uh, impressions, uh, it said that it would be the first digital service. Uh, and that really, it means something a lot to people inside DOD. Uh, could you explain what it exactly that means and how that's different from maybe the forces that we're familiar with today? Sure, sure. So as the first service uh, created in over 70 years, and certainly the first service uh, in the digital age, uh, we're being born into a digital world. Uh, unlike the pr prior services, the, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, and the Air Force, uh, they, they were born in, in an in industrial age. And as a result, um, they have evolved over time to develop and incorporate digital capabilities. The Space Force we're, we're born into this digital age. Uh, and so we have that as part of our fabric. Uh, also, space is an inc uh, incredibly technical field and, and we've been tied uh, via digital means to our capabilities uh, from the beginning uh, of our space uh, ventures, um, you know, going back to, uh, to the early 60s. Um, you know, our operators don't sit in the cockpits and, and fly the satellites uh, in orbit. Uh, they sit on the ground and, and operate them remotely and virtually through, uh, through command blanks. Um, so we've, we've been a digital service uh, from the beginning because of, of our creation uh, uh, in the digital age, as well as uh, by, by very nature of uh, the type of operations that we conduct. And, and what does that mean for the people who are in the Space Force? You know, a lot of people have moved over from uh, the Air Force at this point, other people are moving in from other services and you're also recruiting as well. So. Um, you know, what might a guardian see uh, as someone who is in the Space Force now that is particularly digital? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, one of the things I think it's important to, to remind people of is um, being born a digital service does not mean that we're a full-fledged digital powerhouse today. I mean, uh, when a newborn is, is uh, brought into the world, uh, they have certain capabilities, but it's certainly not the set of capabilities they need to have to be a fully functioning adult, for example. Um, and so we have some initial capabilities that, uh, that, that uh, in some cases, we've been fortunate enough to leverage from the Department of the Air Force. And in other cases, as a result of, uh, of COVID, we've had to do things like virtual meetings and, and teleworking. So that element of being a digital service is, is ingrained into us. But one of the things that we thought was very important is when, when people like General Raymond say, we are a digital service, it raises the question, okay, well, well what is that? What does that really mean? And so that's why we thought it was really important uh, to release the vision for a digital service uh, last May. Uh, it serves as a, a, a guiding uh, document to say, where do we wanna be 15, 20 years? So it's an aspirational document, but in many ways, it's also an educational document. Uh, what we find is uh, there are people uh, in the Space Force and in government that have a variety, a spectrum of, if you will, of knowledge about what it is to be digital. And so we wanted to try to raise everybody's overall understanding of some digital terminology uh, and, and put us all on more of a level playing field about the terms and concepts that are essential to being a digital service. And, you know, I'd like to dig into that uh, vision in a second, but one of the things that I wanted to ask you to do, uh, which probably a lot, a lot of guardians are annoyed with having to do at this point, but I was recently reading an article that a lot of guardians uh, are realizing people still don't know exactly what the Space Force does. And, uh, you know, for our listeners and for our, our watchers, I was hoping that you could help explain and put to rest uh, some uh, and the amb ambiguity that is going on uh, with the Space Force and explain what it is you do and why you're important to the military. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, if you watch late night television or, or Netflix uh, shows, uh, we've been the butt of some jokes. And, and uh, that's understandable. Not a lot of people understand just how critical space is to our daily lives, right? Um, be it the, the GPS signal uh, that, that we get to help us navigate uh, or to synchronize the timing mechanisms uh, in our uh, automatic uh, teller machines, you know, ATMs uh, or, or wire transfers, uh, weather forecasts to identify when the next hurricane's coming, 
um, missile warning to identify when threats are, are inbound to, to forces that are deployed. Um, just on and on, we use space uh, on a daily basis, uh, both uh, for our, our national security as well as our, our way of life as a, as a world leader. And so it's important for us to protect those capabilities. And it's, it's doubly important because adversaries like potentially Russia and China have recognized our overall uh, dependence and, and strong utilization of space and are developing capabilities to threaten those and take that advantage that we gain from space away from us. And so it's really important that we develop a capability that helps protect that, that uh, set of uh, force supporting elements, if you will, that we get from space for our way of life and for our way of warfare. Um, and that's really why the Space Force was so e essential to be created, uh, to protect those capabilities that, uh, that we use uh, on a daily basis. So going back to that vision that the uh, Space Force is, is using, there's four focus areas, I believe, within that vision. And you know, could you just sort of enumerate those a bit, maybe go a bit into what those are? Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to. Thank you. Uh, so there's actually uh, four focus areas, we call them, and, and three tenants, and I'm happy to talk about, about each of those, but I'll start with the yep. four focus areas. I like to start with digital workforce, and, and what that means is how can we help train and educate and prepare our workforce, our guardians, to operate in a digital service. We want to raise their overall level of digital fluency, how familiar they are with the language, how accustomed they are to talking about digital capabilities. So we're rolling out things like digital university courses, software development, immersive uh, pipelines, et cetera, to, to train and educate our workforce so that they are ready uh, to, to operate in a digital environment. The next area I'd like to talk about is digital engineering. So you've got the people, now you need the, the tools to operate within this digital environment. And while di digital engineering has certainly a tie to an acquisition side or the development of a capability, we like to think of it as an entire end-to-end -end ecosystem. So all the way from force design that or an organization like the Space War Fighting and Analysis Center does at the very you know, inception of, of what architecture we want many years down the road. Through the development of capabilities, through the planning and programming and budgeting aspects to ensure that we have the funding to, to make these uh, ideas come to reality, uh, to the design, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, operations, the testing, the development of tactics, techniques, and procedures that we can do in a virtual environment, all the way to the sustainment uh, of that system once it's on orbit, um, so that we can compare real world data with what we would expect in a virtual and maybe identify threats or vulnerabilities or, or anomalies in a more rapid fashion. So it's this end-to-end -end thread of, of digital engineering capabilities that, that we want to create. So that's, that's digital engineering. The third area is digital headquarters. And uh, I think a lot of people will think headquarters, so you're talk, just talking about the, the, the headquarters there in the Pentagon, but that's not true. We're, we're thinking about any level within the Space Force where, where decisions are made. We wanna make data-driven uh, decisions uh, that are informed in a collaborative way um, and, and maximize the utility of the resources that we have available to us. So it's how to make the most effective uh, and efficient decisions utilizing the digital tools that are available to us at, at all levels. And then finally, digital operations is where it all culminates. It's where we take the workforce, the ecosystem, and the decision-making and really bring it all together to deliver a, a capability uh, to secure that, uh, that vital uh, space interest that we talked about earlier, uh, or to project the power that we need to support uh, operations terrestrially. And so things like space domain awareness, uh, things like the joint all domain command and control that helps us integrate uh, our uh, operational planning. Those are some of the areas within digital operations that we'd be pursuing. And now, before we go into the tenets, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, it sounds like a common thread through all of these things is, is data and also it is uh, coding in a way. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about this digital service and what guardians are expected to know um, and, and the classes that you're providing. Uh, you know, how much coding and how much uh, digital literacy is needed to be a guardian um, compared to maybe, you know, an infantryman in the army? Granted, those things are changing over time. Uh, but, you know, is there a, uh, a difference for, for a guardian? And, uh, you know, how are you providing that sort of education for them? 
Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Thank you. Um, so I, I would expect a guardian to have a, a higher level of data fluency or digital fluency uh, or familiarity uh, than uh, an army infantryman uh, or actually any other service. So we believe we're going to be uh, much more technically attuned than any other service. And so uh, the, the overall baseline level of knowledge that we expect all guardians to achieve uh, is higher than those that came over from the Air Force might have been experiencing on, on the Air Force side, for example. Um, it's also going to change over time, right? Uh, as uh, our capabilities and as our, our knowledge continues to grow, our requirement is going to continue to grow. So it's not like we can say, here's the baseline that uh, if you know these five things, you're set for the rest of uh, rest of the, you know, existence of the Space Force. No, it's, it's going to evolve over time. And I would expect, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, the guardians that are coming in who were definitely born, you know, digital natives, they will come in with a much higher level of digital fluency than, than we do now and certainly than I do. Um, but you asked, how are we getting after that? How are we providing that education? And so we, we're doing it in a couple different ways. Uh, I'd like to start with digital university as that foundational level of knowledge. And so what we've brought together is a set of training modules. There's actually over 23,000 different training modules from industry leading experts um, that provide training about artificial intelligence, about cybersecurity, about data, about uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera. And we've culminated these into um, uh, th this pipeline through Digital University. We've even gone a little further and said, there are sets of courses that we think would be ideal for guardians to know. So we've created what we call force multiplier, force multiplier pipelines for people to go. So if you wanna learn more about AI in particular, here's 10 hours worth of training that you can, you can take and become not an expert at AI, of course, but certainly much more familiar. Again, this is all about the, that foundational level of understanding that we expect all guardians to, to get to. So we've, we rolled out uh, Digital University actually <clears throat> with, with the first birthday of the Space Force. And in the past year, we've, we've had over, uh, I believe, uh, over 16,000 hours of training administered to over 3,000 of our guardians. So it, it's getting out there. We're continuing to, to add and evolve that Digital University curriculum and, and add new courses as, uh, as material becomes available from industry. That's that foundation level that, that we start with. Um, and then there are other courses like the Software Development Immersive that um, will give specialized training to a certain set of folks that we, we want to develop uh, another level of capability. So coding, for example, we send people to the Software Development Immersive and they come out super coders uh, and they're able to apply the coding skills that they've learned afterwards to help uh, solve problems back in their operational and, uh, uh, and uh, home units. Yeah, um, you know, so the the actual um, university that you're talking about, you know, is that a like a, a does that something that goes along with boot camp? Uh, you know, is this a coding boot camp that they would go through as as part of their basic training? So the 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 digital university isn't so much a coding boot camp. It's more of a let's get everybody on on the same level of understanding about certain skills. I think the the coding boot camp is more attuned to. Uh, uh, another set of, of courses that we would have to develop or, or leverage as part of their, uh, you know, education, either through high school or college, that they they have some level of coding. Because the people that we select to go through the software development immersive, they already have some level of coding skill. So it's it's beyond a boot camp level. We're trying to develop some expertise uh, in those specific areas. Right, and and just to mention, you know, the Air Force, or I'm sorry, the Space Force is not going to be a big uh, force in itself. It's only going to be about 16,000 people, right? So um, yeah. you have the ability to be picky in some ways uh, to pick the, the most talented people. That, that's absolutely true. Um, and, and thanks for bringing up the, the size of the Space Force because um, we, we have to hit way above our, our weight class, if you, if you will, right? The, the capabilities that we're entrusted with and the effects that we are, are expected to be able to deliver go beyond what you know, a small force of 16,000 or so uh, could achieve. And so it's imperative for us to be able to leverage these digital tools to, to uh, be as effective and efficient as possible. 
and, and yes, we, we expect that we'll be fairly selective in our recruiting process and, and in our retention areas. Um, and so, you know, we, we want the best and the brightest and, uh, and we'll, we'll recruit those people to get it. And certainly uh, I'm very happy with the, the force that we have today and, and the force that we're growing into. Uh, we're bringing on some incredible people and, and it really makes me proud to, to see uh, what we're creating here. So, um, you know, we were talking about the the visions that you had. You have these four tenets for your for your vision. Uh, there are also three other, excuse me, there are four core basically areas in, in it, and then there's three tenets. Yeah. So, uh, you know, would you mind telling us about the three tenets and how they fit into to sure. this vision itself? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's interconnected, innovative, and digitally dominant. You know, when we were writing the vision for a digital service, we, we described what we wanted to be in the future. We described these four focus areas. Uh, we described a little bit about how we're going to get there. And we said at the end of it, you know, we really haven't said, well, what does it mean to be a digital service? Well, what are the three or, or however many it is, the right tenets to say, this is what being a digital service means. And after, you know, uh, talking with senior leaders and doing some crowdsourcing and, and all sorts, we, we came up with interconnected, innovative, digitally dominant. And so interconnected, um, just like it sounds, we're trying to bring together different uh, people, uh, in a virtual sense that may not otherwise work together. We're trying to create a collaborative environment uh, where, where experts from academia, from industry, from anywhere within the Space Force can work together in a collaborative fashion. So that, that interconnective digital thread that, that brings us together, that's, that's the first element because we, we need to have a variety of perspectives. There's no one has a, a monopoly on the right answer. We need to bring in different perspectives to solve some of the challenging problems that we're facing. Innovative. So innovative is like it sounds. We, we want people to always think about what is the better way to do things? How can we improve from where we are today? Don't accept the status quo as that's what I have to live with. You always need to try to innovate to make things better. And within that, we, we talked about two tenets of, of, of innovation, and that is attitude and aptitude. So with aptitude, we're going to recruit the folks that have the, 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 the savvy, the background, the education to develop these digital skills. But even more importantly, the, the attitude, right? We, we need people that are always trying to improve, that are always thirsty to learn what's next and to apply their knowledge and, and make recommendations on how to make things better. And so that innovative sense of being both uh, having the right attitude and aptitude is critical. And then finally, digitally dominant. And this is where I, I tend to take a, a little more time because I think if someone hears the term digitally dominant uh, in a military sense, they're thinking we're gonna dominate the cyberspace domain. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a preference, a way of thinking about things that prefers thinking of it in a digital sense. So for example, I'm, I'm left-handed, I'm left dominant, uh, but I do some things with my right hand, like, like swing a golf club, for example, not very well, but I do. Um, and so that just gives you an example of what it is to be dominant in one way versus another. And in the same way that uh, when we were in the Air Force, we talked about air mindedness. We want people in the Space Force to be able to think space mindedness, certainly, but also have a preference for digital solutions, have a pr propensity to think about things in a digital sense. And how does that manifest? In an industrial age organization, uh, someone who's taking forward a, 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 a pitch to their, to their boss to say, hey, I'd like to go off and, and do this. They might put together a PowerPoint presentation. And for years, we've been using PowerPoint as a regular basis. It's a, it's a, it's a great tool. But if you think about it in a more digitally, fluent uh, manner, what you're presenting might be better represented in a dashboard. And here's how we're tracking our progress. And if I make this change, you can see that I'm gonna, you know, have this increase in productivity or deliver this higher level of capability. And so we want people to think about things in a digital sense, as opposed to a more industrial age sense. So interconnective, innovative, and digital. And, you know, I wanted to just before we take a break here in a couple of minutes, I wanted to ask about you are the the deputy uh, innovation officer as well. Um, you know, how are you bringing up people and opening up your ears and your eyes to the innovation that's coming from your guardians yeah. uh, in, and from, you know, the coding that they're probably really interested in doing? 
Yeah, so this is one of my favorite parts of, of my job is uh, innovations in our name, certainly, but we don't own innovation, right? We're, we're here to help steer innovation and help cultivate innovation because it's it's the men and women uh, in the Space Force, our guardians, that are really going to be the innovators that are going to come up with those ideas that make their lives better as well as all guardians, make all of their lives better. So I, I like to think of, of, the, of the CTIO, our office, the Chief Technology and Innovation Office, um, having four major responsibilities. Um, one, we want to put a spotlight on where innovation is occurring so that other people can see it and learn from it. Uh, two, we want to bridge capabilities and, and, and partnerships. So if one organization is struggling with a problem, another organization has solved it, we want to be that connective tissue that brings them together so that they can work again collaboratively. Um, three, we want to be able to provide direction. Um, and that's partly what we did with that vision for a digital service and say, here's where we want to head as a service. These are the types of things that, that will add value to all members of the Space Force. And so here's some direction to go up and do, because there's a lot of great ideas out there and there's a lot of energy and talent. We want to try to harness that towards a common objective. And then finally, champion. This is where once we've spotlighted an activity or, or bridged uh, some connections, we want to make sure that they've got the resources and the manpower and everything they need to be fully successful. And so th those are the four areas where I think our office from an innovation perspective uh, are, are really big players. So, you know, before we were talking a lot about how you're becoming the first digital service and uh, you know, how that is important for the people that work at the Space Force and also for uh, how you innovate. One of the things I want to ask you about another very important part of the digital atmosphere is cybersecurity. So what sort of worries do you have considering the ever-changing aspect of, of cybersecurity and cyber? And uh, you know, what are you working with at this point? Yeah, so th thanks for that question. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you in the second part of our uh, discussion today. The, uh, the cybersecurity threat is, is something that uh, you know, has been in the news a lot lately and uh, is certainly uh, a, a prescient threat that we need to uh, make sure we, we get after. Um, as we talk about creating a digital service, uh, to enable ourselves to become more effective and efficient, we don't at the same time want to create a new vulnerability for us that could be exploited by a potential adversary. And so security uh, is, is really at the beginning of all of our thinking as we move forward in becoming a digital service. So there, as we develop capabilities, um, what we refer to as uh, DevSecOps, development, security, and operations. It's where we can bring developers, security experts, uh, operators, together uh, to develop a new capability that uh, will enhance uh, our ability to uh, uh, deliver the effects that we need. And so we, we try to bring in uh, those experts and think about those challenges uh, from the beginning. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna talk to you about uh, what any of our vulnerabilities might be or, or how we're trying to mitigate that because that would be counterproductive. But I think you can understand that uh, Cybersecurity and security in general is, is always a concern for us as, as a military organization. Uh, and certainly we know that there are a lot of threats out there. Uh, you know, it's not lost on us on, on why we need to become a separate service at this time. And so the threat is something that we're uh, always thinking about and, and making sure that, that we address uh, in all of our capabilities that we develop. One of the things the military has been thinking about as it starts to acquire and procure systems is how to bake in cybersecurity into the systems from the beginning. Um, you know, how are you thinking about that as you, uh, you know, bring on new new systems? I realize you're you're a new service, and so you're not bringing on a ton of new systems right now. But I'm sure that's definitely in the conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. So when we when I talk about DevSecOps and as a way to develop new capabilities, uh, we are baking it in from the beginning and, and any ad additional refinements that we make over time. Security has got to be, as you said, baked in from the very beginning and not bolted on at the end. So it, it's it's ever present in the minds of our developers and certainly in the minds of our operators uh, as, as we develop new capabilities and as we continue to operate those uh, that we have and, and make refinements and adjustments. Um, so yeah. Absolutely, we're we're definitely looking at uh, at cybersecurity uh, on a daily basis. And what about guardians? Um, you know, we all know that at this point, uh, cybersecurity is your weakest link when it comes to the person that leaves their uh, password on a sticky note, right? Um, how do you keep them in line? And uh, also, 
how do you operate in this COVID environment? Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more things with VPNs and, and trying to work in classified environments. Yeah, so th there's there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, sure. So I'll, I'll do my best to, to try to hit all of the, the key features. Um, let's start with uh, how do we train our guardians uh, to operate in a secure fashion? Um, so I, I talked earlier about the digital university force multiplier courses. One of the one of the pipelines within there is all about cybersecurity. Uh, it, it goes into more detail about how to achieve cybersecurity and, and different different uh, methodologies. Um, so so that's actually a, a great fundamental course. Uh, additionally, ever since I've been uh, in the military with a computer, I've had to take some sort of annual cybersecurity re re refresher training. You know, it talks about don't leave things on a sticky note, don't share your password, all, all that good stuff. So we're doing what we can to, to educate and train all of our new guardians and all of the existing guardians about the, the threats that are out there uh, and, and cybersecurity measures to uh, protect against those. Now, I, I, here's where I'm gonna pivot a little bit from talking about just the state force and talk a little bit larger about the Air Force and to some extent, the, the Department of Defense. We are still part of the Department of the Air Force. And so the uh, uh, enterprise IT, uh, and data standards that, that uh, we operate with are from the Department of the Air Force. And so we're working with them on ensuring we have the right cybersecurity standards and the right training and, and the right uh, capabilities in place to pre prevent against uh, cyber attacks. Additionally, within the Department of Defense, organizations like DISA and Cyber Command are working to protect our networks uh, on a daily basis uh, against uh, threats from, from a variety of actors. And so it's that multiple layers of capability and, and constant vigilance that are helping to secure our networks and, and the, the missions that the Guardians are executing. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, data. Uh, we've seen the Defense Department sort of reorganize their chief data officer, their chief information office, and, and artificial intelligence all into one area, uh, one that's probably a little more higher up than it, it used to be. Um, and, you know, your position uh, really affords you a lot of uh, ability to move uh, with the Space Force, to move the Space Force forward. Um, you know, how do you see your job and your office evolving uh, as the Space Force really starts to take hold and, and maybe even 20 years down the road when it's already taken hold? Yeah, so the, the, the role of data, the importance of data really can't be understated. Uh, it is the lifeblood of any digital organization. Uh, you know, the, the old saying goes, uh, knowledge is power. Well, that knowledge comes from data today. Uh, and so how we can access that data, how do we assure that it is uh, uh, the right data and hasn't been tampered with? Uh, how do we ensure that we get all of the data that we need uh, in a timely fashion? Those are, those are critical elements of um, our data considerations. Within the CTIO, uh, we do have a lead for data. And they work very closely, as I mentioned, with the Department of the Air Force's uh, Chief Data Officer, uh, as well as within the field commands across the Space Force uh, to ensure that we're developing the right data governance standards uh, and policies to help us uh, secure our, our data sets and also make them accessible to the right users at the right time. Um, so I, I think as, as the office grows, um, and we're, you know, we're about 18 months old ourselves and the service is just over two years, as the office grows and as the Space Force grows, I think uh, the, the guidance that we're able to provide and our understanding of how to utilize data effectively um, in this modern age it is going to continue to evolve. And so I, I think that's a huge growth area because, uh, like I said, data is the lifeblood for a digital organization. It's, it's the, the food that will feed the uh, AI engines and machine learning capabilities uh, that, that are going to be you know, integral uh, to our future way of, uh, of operations. And the Space Force is going to be taking on more responsibilities very soon too. I mean, I believe there's, there's Starcom, you have the Space and Missile Center, um, you know, there's Spock. Um, there's so many different things that you have that you're, you're bringing in. I mean, um, that's a lot to bring together and to, um, to connect all together when it comes to systems and, and just organizationally, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, Space Operations Command uh, out in Colorado Springs continue to operate the satellites uh, with, with their uh, mission deltas. Uh, that's a great organization, I think, building a lot of what Air Force Base Command was. 
so Lieutenant Colonel Whiting is doing a phenomenal job uh, leading that organization and all the, the, the great guardians out there continuing to operate day in and day out. Uh, Space Systems Command is an evolution from where S Space and Missile Systems Center was. So Space System Command under Lieutenant Colonel Gutlein is going to uh, continue to develop uh, new capabilities, uh, including digital uh, capabilities. And, uh, and we're working very closely with them uh, on the digital engineering uh, ecosystem that we're creating. Uh, the, uh, the STARCOM uh, uh, under General Bratton uh, is going to, which is Space Training and Readiness Command, uh, is all about education, it's all about the training, it's all about the testing of our capabilities. And integral to all of that is a level of uh, education and training about digital and education and training with digital to help us use digital tools to train uh, our operators and our acquirers and, and all of our guardians uh, on how to uh, utilize the systems more effectively. So uh, we, we want to create, as I mentioned, that digital engineering ecosystem earlier. There is a, there's a test and training element uh, of that as well that, that's going to be critical. And then there's also uh, the Space War Fighting Analysis Center at the very end, uh, front end of our digital engineering ecosystem, we're going to force design work for uh, what sort of systems and capabilities we're going to need to have uh, to face future challenges. So yeah, we're, we're trying to bring all of those together. We're having uh, ongoing dialogues with all of those offices uh, to, to uh, uh, ensure that as we build our capabilities, we don't build them in stove pipes and then try to, try to cross stitch them later. We want to build them in an integrated fashion from the beginning. And along those lines, one of the things that the Space Force really sold itself on was that it's a, a force that can start from scratch and it doesn't have all of these, the things you said, stovepipes. It doesn't have to worry about, um, you know, all these legacy systems necessarily. Um, will you be able to share data fairly easily between all these facets of uh, the Space Force? And, you know, I realize maybe training doesn't have to do with some sort of operational thing necessarily, but um, you know, it is important at times to make sure that there is a lot of permeability between the different offices. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to default back to what I said earlier about being born digital, but not being fully capable uh, of where we need to be. Uh, and, and here's why. Uh, the, the systems that we have today uh, are not the systems that are going to take us into the future. They're not the systems that we need to operate to address the threats uh, that are coming. Uh, we're working with our partners at the Department of Air Force and others to, to develop those capabilities that we need. Um, it, it's, it's one thing to talk in an aspirational sense about what the vision for a digital service is. But when our guardians struggle with, uh, you know, access via a VPN or, uh, you know, Outlook is crashing or something along those lines or, or the, the, the laptop they're having is glitching. It, it, it kind of uh, rings hollow to them. And so we're trying to address all of those those concerns as well. But one of the things that Dr. Costa, who is the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer, uh, likes to talk about is um, it's not the pain points so much that we need to try to address one by one. It's the leap ahead capability that is actually going to take care of all of those pain points in sort of one fell swoop. So we're, we're, we're knowledgeable. We're trying to get after some of those areas, but we're trying to do it in a way that's going to take us to a whole new level of capability. And, and solve uh, many of those problems uh, just as a matter of course. And you know, one of the ways that you can do that, uh, obviously, is working with your uh, partners in academia and partners in industry. Um, you know, what are you looking for, and how can you reach out to them uh, a little bit better and in new ways with uh, with the space force and with your pivotability? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. So. The partnerships are absolutely critical to the Space Force. As a small service, we know that we can't do it alone. Um, and we recognize that we are part of a joint community and we're part of a whole national security uh, infrastructure. Uh, so partnerships are absolutely critical, uh, both uh, within the government, within academia, within industry, and our international partners, right? Uh, many of our uh, leading technologists are coming from uh, some of our uh, allied nations. Um, so we need to be able to reach out to all of them and, and bring in the best and brightest to, to help address those, those uh, issues and challenges that we're facing. So one of the areas that we're reaching out to academia, for example, is through the University Partnership Program and the University Consortium. And so this is where we're able to create a, a, a standing relationship with, with colleges based on the uh, type of uh, 
areas that they're expert in and some of the research areas that they're focusing on. And uh, it, it's a great way to, to get some of the knowledge uh, from that academic uh, institution, as well as share some of our, um, uh, our challenges and have them help us address them. Uh, so we're creating these partnerships through the University Partnership Program and the University Consortium to help um, move our science and technology research area forward uh, in some very uh, key ways. And another area is uh, just internships. Last summer, we were able to bring in eight interns uh, into the CTIO, into our office, uh, from different colleges uh, across the country. And those interns will go back to their institutions and talk to their, their friends, their teachers, uh, about their experience in the Space Force. And, and, and many of them are coming back to us this summer uh, as in full employees after graduation. And so we're trying to get after uh, these partnerships in a variety of ways. And uh, you know, the academic area is certainly one that we're, we're going full throttle after. And you know, these consortia, I mean, I realized the ones you just talked about were academic, but there's also now business consortia too that DOD and, and the Space Force have been able to work with and um, you know, contracting in uh, more quicker ways uh, using things like OTAs, mid-tier acquisition, um, you know, are you utilizing any of those sorts of things at this point? And, and does that help you bring in more industry that you can work faster? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I know about this from my previous job when I was at the Space and Missile Systems Center, uh, but I'm, I'm always glad to be able to talk to, to the great work that was done out there. Uh, uh, Captain Adam Burnetta, uh, I think he's Major Adam Burnetta now, uh, was leading that effort called the Space uh, Enterprise Consortium. Uh, and this is an area where we're using those other transaction authorities and bringing together a consortium of uh, uh, industry partners, some of which are, are the traditional partners, but actually many are, are non-traditional partners. So those companies that have never done any business with the, uh, with the government or, or the military before. And this, this is a mechanism that helps us uh, move forward uh, with, with rapid uh, contract awards uh, and, and advanced uh, technology efforts and, and research areas uh, to deliver uh, prototype capabilities uh, in a very rapid fashion. So that Space Enterprise Consortium, uh, other transaction authority uh, is actually a huge success. And they're actually in their second iteration uh, of that uh, contract vehicle. And so I, I just can't say enough great things about the work that's being done out there at Space Systems Command uh, to reach into those, uh, those areas. What are the, some of the ways that you're reaching out to uh, companies that may not have worked with the Defense Department or with the Space Force before? Uh, I know that that's a big area where uh, you're trying to expand. Um, you know, how do you find them and how do you tell them that, you know, it's not so scary working with us? Yeah, so there are a, a lot of great initiatives out there uh, through AFWorks uh, and now through SpaceWorks that's being stood up. Uh, to reach out to some of these non-traditionals. In addition to the Space Enterprise Consortium, uh, there's also accelerators to the Air Force Research Lab that we're able to leverage uh, that create uh, small business innovative research uh, contract vehicles that help uh, accelerate uh, and, and train the, the folks uh, that aren't familiar with the process on how to uh, bid for a contract um, uh, with the government and, and, and help them through that process. And so those accelerators, the SpaceWorks, um, the, the Space Enterprise Consortium, those are all great avenues for, for folks that aren't familiar with, with how to contract with the government um, and, and how to get in to help the space uh, mission areas. So you mentioned that the Space Force is now uh, about two years old, a little over two. Um, so what do you see as some of the bigger challenges uh, for your coming months and possibly years uh, as this continues to develop? Uh, you know, what are you keeping your eye on? So one of the things that, that uh, I uh, like to uh, think about is all of the technologies that are out there, all of the capabilities that we want to go after. And it's almost like a kid in a candy store. There, there's all of these great things that we can pursue. It's gonna take us discipline uh, to say, uh, I've scanned the area and I wanna go in this direction. And then it's gonna take dedicated effort uh, to, to move us in that, in that way in a concerted fashion. So um, being able to constantly survey uh, the potential trade space, being able to down select to a specific set of activities that, that we do uh, and, and then move out uh, on those smart ways. That's really uh, where I think we're gonna be 
really working hard uh, from the CPIO and other areas across the Space Force uh, to move us forward. And, um, you know, just a couple last questions for you. Uh, you know, the CR, um, something that we're, we've, we're seeing pushing down, you know, every couple months, um, you know, we don't know necessarily where it will be in, in coming years, but uh, I was wondering about how the Space Force, uh, you know, has to deal with, with a CR compared to, you know, other more entrenched uh, uh, services, you know, does that hurt you more in the plans that you have when you can't necessarily have the new starts that you were looking forward to or the funding you were expecting? Yeah, so I mean, the, the continuing resolution authority uh, uh, that, we're, that we're under right now, it, it certainly uh, does not make things easier, uh, but neither does a global pandemic. Uh, so I, I like to tell people we're creating a hard um, uh, but that's okay. We've got, we've got the right talented uh, personnel and the right leaders in place. Uh, and, and I think a, a, a set of guardians that are just passionate about moving us forward. And so we're gonna do everything we can uh, to move forward and to achieve what we need to achieve um, to, to get the capabilities that we need. Uh, the, the new start aspect, uh, you know, that, that is a challenge, uh, but we're able to, you know, continue some of the lines that we had before we were a separate service and, and move those forward. Um, you know, we're going to continue to work with our partners in Congress, and we're going to continue to work with our, our partners in the Department of the Air Force and the Department of Defense and, and get the capabilities that we need um, because you know, we can't afford not to. And just finally, uh, you know, how can people reach out to you if they want to help out with the Space Force, if they want to work with the Space Force, um, you know, going forward, what can they do if they uh, want to work with you? Uh, th thanks for that question, and thanks again for the opportunity to, to talk about the digital transformation in the Space Force. Uh, and it's always a pleasure for me to, uh, to talk to, to folks and help educate people about what it is we do and, and why the Space Force is so important and what the heck is the CTIO as an office anyway. Um, they, they can reach out to me. Uh, uh, my, I'm, I'm on the global address list, uh, and, uh, and my contact information can be made available uh, through a link uh, through public affairs if need be. Um, but you can certainly reach out to me that way. Uh, I, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, so you can reach out to me on, uh, on LinkedIn as well. And, uh, you know, continue to, to look at the Space Enterprise Consortium and AppWorks and SpaceWorks and areas like that. Additionally, uh, Dr. Costa and the rest of the leadership team within the CTAO, uh, we're out there at events uh, speaking and engaging with folks uh, on a regular basis. And so they're, you know, coming to a, a town hall near you, virtual or otherwise, uh, we'll be there to talk and, and engage about uh, the challenges that we're seeing, uh, the bold visions that we're having for uh, how we can shape the future and, and deliver that game-changing capability uh, that we're looking for uh, within the CTIO. Colonel Charles Galbraith is the Deputy Chief Technology and Innovation Officer for the Space Force. I'm your moderator, Scott Massioni, and you're listening to Federal News Network. Now let me send you back to the studio with more on the DoD Cloud Exchange.